I like to think we're sort of in an air pocket right now, which is when you get bond yields up high enough, they start to slow the economy. Because once they start to slow the economy, then you'd expect the Fed to ease, and that's a good time to buy bonds. But the problem is bonds are too high for stocks to keep rallying, but not high enough for the economy to slow down. You really need bond yields to move into the fives, probably, to get to the point where they've moved high enough to create enough of drag on asset prices in the economy to start that easing cycle to actually kick off. Bob Elliott, co-founder, CIO, and CEO of Unlimited. It is so great to welcome you back on the show and great to see you again, Bob. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me, Julia. It's uh, It's been incredible how much uh, the channel has grown since the last time we talked. It's very exciting to see all that success. You are so, way uh, too congratulations. Kind. Thank you so much. And I think this is your third appearance on the channel and it's great to have you back because, wow, okay, I feel like a lot has transpired since we last had you on, which would have been like probably over six months ago at this point. And so let's just kind of catch up and get your big picture, macro view, where we are today, that framework in which you're looking at the world. And as you know, Bob, you can take all the time you need to set the table when it comes to the macro picture. Yeah, well, I think in some ways, the big picture macro dynamic that we've been in for the last sort of 18 to 24 months hasn't really changed all that much in the sense of we're in a late cycle environment. You know, the Fed has tightened in order to respond to that late cycle environment and the uh, elevated inflationary pressures that have come with it. Um, those inflation pressures have moderated in part because supply chain issues have been resolved to some extent and in part because of the tightening of monetary policy. But uh, we're not yet at the point in which, you know, for the U.S. economy where inflation is back to the Fed's mandate and honestly not, not clearly... Uh, on a path to get there anytime soon. And so that really creates a challenging circumstance for the for the Fed, because basically what they see right now is they see an economy that is quite sustainably growing. Um, in a lot of ways, I like to describe it as income dominance uh, in the economy to contrast that with how others describe it from other sources. Predominantly, what we're seeing is an income uh, generated expansion where you know, people's income, people are spending out of their income. Uh, and that spending, that increase in nominal spending is leading to uh, incomes elsewhere, yeah, incomes for other people, and that that's leading to more spending. And that's a that's a very virtuous dynamic, and it's a very sustainable dynamic. So unlike credit-driven ex, uh, expansions that we've seen, you know, through much of our careers, an income-driven expansion is, is totally sustainable. You can keep you know, earn 6%, spend 6%, earn 6%, spend 6%. That can continue on for a while. And I think part of the challenge that the Fed is facing um, is that that nominal income growth is too high relative to productivity growth in the economy. And it's so sustainable and not particularly sensitive to interest rate hikes, which means that we're sort of stuck in the current environment where inflation's too high, nominal, in nominal growth is too strong, inflation, you know, uh, and the economy can sustain this path even at a higher level of interest rates. Okay, that's an interesting frame up. And in when you point out like the income um, driven that the income driven dynamic of it, how much of that do, does that how much of that part of the equation does that contribute to the inflation that we see as well? Like if if more people are spending on on the goods and the services, how much does that drive it? Yeah, I mean, I, if you can think about inflation uh, from a couple of different angles. One way to look at it is to sort of look bottoms up, good by good, right? How much is services X housing and housing and core goods and oil prices and stuff like that. And that can define how to think about uh, inflation and what's likely to transpire. On the flip side, the other way to look at it um, is to think about the structural inflation in the economy as a function of what does nominal wage growth look like? relative to productivity growth. <clears throat> and so as an example, if I'm paying someone, you know, their wages are increasing on an hourly basis by 6% a year, and their productive capacity is only increasing by 1% a year, well, then naturally, what has to happen is the difference between that nominal income uh, earnings that they're getting, that nominal income growth, versus the productivity growth in the economy defines what the structural 
inflationary pressure is because the difference between those two essentially has to be a rise in prices. And so I think what we're seeing uh, when we're looking at the economy today is that we're seeing that structural inflation dynamic that hasn't really resolved well enough. You know, wages on an hourly basis are running at maybe a 5% growth rate, between 4 and 5%, depending on how exactly you measure it and what exactly you measure. Whereas productivity growth, I think there's a lot of promise that uh, maybe we'd have a productivity boom uh, coming you know, as a function of AI and other, other actions. And the reality is productivity is actually chopped sideways since the COVID period, the measured productivity in the economy that's output per hour work. And so you look at that and you say nominal wage growth at four or 5%, productivity growth that's most mainly flat, the difference between those creates structural inflation in the economy. And that is interestingly lining up with what we're seeing on the measured side when you sort of take the bottoms up approach price by price. And all of that is just too high for the Fed's mandate. Yeah. Okay. So let's explore that further. Um, inflation, it's still way too high for the Fed's mandate. Um, even going back to the beginning of the year, that remember like a lot of folks were expecting, what was it, like six cuts this year? I want to get your take. Well, obviously, that's definitely out the, out the window. Um, we know that. What do you, What is kind of your thought process on the Fed's interest rate policy? We've had some interesting guests on this show who even thought that, you know, maybe we might even see a probability of a hike that that's increased. What's your take on um, the interest rate policy for, you know, headed into the summer, maybe remainder of the year? Well, certainly if you just looked at a central bank, you know, in a in a normal circumstance, and you said, we have a set of conditions where uh, unemployment's at secular lows, the growth rate in the economy has been, you know, at or above potential for seven quarters in a row, um, and inflation remains elevated. Uh, after a period of being way above what the target is. You'd look at that set of conditions and you'd say that central bank probably at a minimum should be doing, you know, keeping rates stable and possibly hiking further given that set of circumstances. And so I think that, uh, you know, in many ways people look at the Fed and they try and read the tea leaves on exactly what Powell said in this meeting or that meeting. And the reality is it doesn't really matter because Chairman Powell is going to respond to the data. And the, and the Fed is going to respond to the data that they see. And so even though they thought that they might cut a lot, you know, coming into the into the beginning of the year, the data hasn't complied. They haven't gotten the confidence that they needed in order to behave that way. And so what that functionally means is that they're probably going to transition to an easing cycle in a much slower pace than, uh, than you know, certainly was expected at the beginning of the year. Now, does that mean that they're going to transition to hikes? I think they're a little boxed in, and I think this is one of the challenges of trying to give forward guidance from a central banker's perspective, is it really does constrain their flexibility. Like the hurdle to be able to switch to hikes is probably very high, meaning, you know, inflation printing one or two percent higher on an annualized rate than what it's printing right now before they would have the e sufficient evidence uh, to really start a renewed hiking cycle. Um, and so more likely than not, what they're going to do is uh, is what many central bankers do. Uh, the actual natural state for a central banker is not to do much. The natural state for a central banker is one with great inertia, which is to basically just stay put until you find enough information that drives you uh, to move in one direction or the other. And so I think the most likely circumstance is the Fed will sort of keep rolling in this in this state right now, which is they'll keep collecting more information, trying to gain confidence for cuts, uh, even as inflation prints, you know, above what their uh, what their target is for an extended period of time. Yeah. Okay. So sounds like we're going to be in this higher for longer environment. How do you kind of extrapolate that out and what that might mean for the broader economy, keeping rates higher for longer? What does that mean? For most of the economy, uh, the fact that interest rates are where they are right now doesn't really matter. If you're a household that, you know, uh, owns your car outright, uh, owns a house, has a 3% mortgage, you know, is employed and getting wage growth at five or 6% a year, uh, you know, the rise in interest rates that we've seen so far this cycle doesn't really meaningfully influence your day to day. Uh, and the reason why that is, is you're not, in you're not an incremental borrower. And remember, the vast majority of households in the United States are 
you know, homeowners, uh, you know, that are employed, uh, that are, you know, get, uh, receiving decent income growth, have 401ks, those asset prices are going up, their home prices are going up. Like, life looks pretty decent for that cohort of the economy. And so for them, you know, the elevated the elevated interest rate dynamic, the elevated interest rate environment, um, is it's not really creating a drag. The main thing that would start to create a drag on their activity is if we started to see asset prices shift. And I think that's one of the challenges is so far, the rise in interest rates hasn't been enough to slow nominal income growth in the economy, which means that asset prices, you know, whether it's house prices or stocks, et cetera, are continuing to rise. So wealth is continuing to rise. And so households feel comfortable continuing to spend out of their ongoing income rather than increasing their savings. And so the real lever to slowing down the cycle uh, is going to have to come through asset price declines. The main question is, will the Fed do enough to slow down those asset prices uh, in response to elevated inflation? And that's that looks uh, certainly over a time frame that we all care about, you know, the next six, 12 months, they probably aren't going to do enough. So then the real question becomes, will the market do enough to slow down uh, asset price growth, slow down stocks and, and house price growth through a rise in the long end of the bond market? And that's really the, that's the core question is, are bond yields at the long end, which are you know still pricing in cuts, are they going to rise in response to the strength of this economy? Okay, I want to explore that further um, because what would be okay, the rise in the yields in the long end. I want to explore that further because the implications for other asset classes, what that could mean. Let's just like frame it up and then um, flesh it out. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very often people when they think about um, long end bonds, they don't they don't really realize that long term interest rates are basically uh, embedded in every asset. That exists, and and the reason why that is at some levels relatively simple. I'm sure we all remember our you know uh, dividend discount models or our our you know our DCFs uh, from uh, from when we were first learning how to think about markets and and pricing out companies and things like that. And and that is uh, that sort of framework is pertinent because what is a company? All a company is is a future stream of cash flows that get discounted back to today. And what that means is that long-term interest rates are a critical component of that discounting factor. And so you have circumstances, and we've seen this a couple times in the last two years, where once expectations of future growth uh, start to be pretty strong, which they are now, and they were, for instance, last summer, once you sort, there's sort of a limit of how strong uh, earnings growth is likely to be or how strong the economy is likely to be. And so once that gets priced in and is reflected in the level of stock prices, then what ends up happening is the long-term interest rate moving around starts to become a bigger driver of what's going on because people are already expecting strong growth. The question is, how much is that strong growth going to be discounted in order to, to define what the price is of, of the stocks, for instance? And so the bonds are in the stocks and the bonds become the big driver of the market. And that's really what we've seen. A big transition has occurred in the asset markets in the last six weeks, in the first three months of the year. What we saw was stocks and bonds were trading uh, opposite to each other. So stocks were going up and bond yields were rising, meaning bond prices were were falling as stock prices were rising. But once expectations of U.S. growth started to reset from pretty weak coming into the year to pretty high by the begin by the end of last quarter, what started to happen was that bonds and stocks started to trade in a way that was positively correlated to each other, reflecting the fact that the discount rate is now the primary driver of what's going on in asset returns. And so every day we come in and it's like, what's going on in the stocks? Well, just tell me what's happening in the bond market and I can tell you what's happening with the stocks. And so that's what's going on. The long end is the critical driver of asset prices right now. And I think one of the key risks that exists in the market is that pressure, that continuous pressure on the bond market, on the long end of the bond market, through persistent issuance by the federal government driven by very large deficits, that's creating a risk that those that the long end of the bond market continues to be pressured higher at a time when, you know, the stock market is very sensitive to how the bond market moves. Would you say, would that be like one of the biggest risks for you today, that, that dynamic? Well, I think for equity investors, 
Um, the biggest risk is that uh, that that the economy remains too strong, which then creates pressure on the bond market. So in many ways, the expectations that are embedded, say, you know, uh, you know, the stock market isn't the economy, but you know, economists' es estimates of or expectations of 2024 growth are now at 2.5 percent. They came into the year at less than one percent. Now they're at 2.5 percent. That's very strong. Well, if we have growth at 2.5 percent and inflation that continues to be elevated, those dynamics combined with a significant supply on the long end coming from the federal government on an ongoing basis, that's going to probably pressure bond yields higher. And so that's on net bad for stocks, not good for stocks, because the the long end of the bond the long end of the bond curve is just so critical to pricing the equity market at, at this point. Yeah. Okay. So when you look at like markets, how do you how do you want to be? Because like in this kind of environment, like how would you want to be allocated in this kind of framework or setup? Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's a very challenging. Um, the positive stock bond correlation periods are very challenging uh, for uh, for asset holders in general, and in particular, if you if you uh, you know if you're holding like a sixty forty portfolio and there's pressure, you know, inflation pressure or bond supply pressure, that's a that's a that's a toxic combination for your sixty forty portfolio. And so, I think there's basically two things that. Uh, asset holders can can think about in this environment. The first is, given the elevation of asset prices and these pressures that are in place, it may be time to hold more cash relative to assets, given what needs to happen in order to slow the economy. I think there's another path, which is uh, is an inter is an important thing to consider, which is it may well be the case that uh, we have a Fed that chooses not to keep money sufficiently tight for sufficiently long to deal with the inflation problem. In that circumstance, uh, you may have uh, the bond curve steepen uh, in response to expectations of continued strong growth and elevated inflation pressures, which again, to connect back to stocks would be uh, a challenge for, for stock prices. But that sort of environment actually would be very good for gold. Because if the Fed chooses to go down a path of being too easy, Gold should outperform most assets, uh, reflective of the fact that it's you know a contra currency relative to the dollar. And so I think in some ways, investors are best positioned in this sort of environment to have a bit of a barbell approach, which is to recognize that probably the asset prices will fall in general, both stocks and bonds, in order to slow the economy. But there is that risk that the Fed doesn't pursue that. So be prepared for that to some extent. Really, gold, to some extent, uh, uh, commodities, oil prices, uh, is another good way to protect yourself on that side. Okay. Um, and when the bond curve steep, and it's like the well, yields go up, let's say, are you talking about like, I take it you're talking about the 10-year, for example? 10-year is a good, okay. you know, you could just think about the 10-year versus because the two-year or something Because I suppose if like you that. reach like yep. a certain level on the 10-year, suddenly that becomes more attractive for investors. Like, hey, I can put some money here in the 10-year and I can get like 5% yield versus like, I might not want to take that risk in the stock market. Is that how that dynamic would work? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's a bit of a challenging circumstance because, um, because at the current level of interest rates, uh, I like to think we're sort of in an air pocket right now, which is the current level of interest rates is enough so that when bond yields are rising, they are, they are hitting stocks because of that discounting effect that I was describing. And so stock prices, that's why stocks and bonds are trading together in a positive, uh, in a, in a, with a positive correlation. And that will probably break, that positive correlation will break when you get bond yields up high enough, they start to slow the economy. Because once they start to slow the economy, then you'd expect the Fed to ease and that's a good time to buy bonds. And so, but the problem is we're, we're a ways away, you know, under current, uh, under the current level of bond yields. Uh, the economy is doing fine. So we've got to get bond yields up higher before we get to the point that the economy has a sufficient drag so that it ends up slowing down so that the Fed ends up easing. And so that air pocket I described is sort of an asset air pocket where, you know, at 450, bonds are too high for stocks to keep rallying, but not high enough 
for the economy to slow down, you really need bond yields to move into the fives probably to get to the point where they've moved high enough to create enough of drag on asset prices in the economy to start that easing cycle to actually kick off. Um, and and it's going to be a, you know, it would be a painful period transitioning from 450, say to 550 for asset, for traditional asset prices like stocks and bonds. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. This is why it's so great having you on. I like this description of an air pocket. I wanna hear a little bit more about the air pocket that we're in. And when did we kind of enter this dynamic? Was that more recently? Was that like six, like you were saying, was it not, that wasn't like too long ago. Can you kind of, I want to hear more about this air pocket that we're in. The air pocket. Yeah, the air pocket. The air pocket. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think we we had, there was a reason to kick off the year. Um, we were in a, we were in a pretty unique position, which was expectations of US growth were very weak. And we had just experienced the largest financial market, financial conditions easing in 40 years in the in the fourth quarter of 2023. So you put those two things together, though that was very positive for the for uh for the for the real economy and positive for shifting sentiment. And so what happened was people went from expecting, you know, the US economy to be pretty weak in 2024 to now being expecting it to be very strong. And bond yields rose consistent with that. Uh, and so you could have a circumstance where stocks outperform bonds, and that's exactly what happened, uh, reflective of that stronger expected growth in the economy. But then eventually the bond yields, you know, the expectations rise enough and the bond yields rise enough so that that starts to flip. And that's really where the air pocket exists. It's an air pocket between sort of 450 and 550. And I think that's one of the challenges because as you said before, it said, don't you think people you know, at 5% will find bond yields attractive. And I think the real question about when do, when do bonds become attractive, they become attractive at the point in which you think the Fed is really going to start easing. Well, so far, no signs that the Fed is really going to start easing anytime soon. There's a lot of hope that they might ease. There's a lot of speculation that they might ease, but the data doesn't align with the Fed easing at all. And that's the the pain point that, that people keep running into, which is you keep expecting easing and then it doesn't happen. You keep expecting easing, it doesn't happen. And you don't want to be buying bonds until you get to the point where it's pretty clear that there's a darn good reason to ease. Well, secularly low unemployment, not a good reason to ease. Inflation above expect, you know, above target meaningfully and getting worse, not a good reason to ease. There's no good reasons to ease in the market yet. And so that's really the air pocket is this sort of, uh, this point where there is not enough evidence for easing and where asset prices, financial asset prices need that easing to reaccelerate at this point. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, um, I don't, I had a conversation actually with uh, uh, Jim Bianco and it was like the window for the Fed to make like a change in, in policy he was saying like basically they have June to make the kind of a change in policy leading up to the election. Like, I, I don't know, kind of given your experience or, or viewpoints, do you do you think like the Fed, like whatever they do or don't do, if they change policy, would they have to do it sooner than later? Because as we get closer to the election, it might be more difficult for them to actually change course. Yeah, I, I think the the Fed, if you just look back through time, uh, the Fed is engaged in both hiking cycles and easing cycles uh, ahead of and around elections. Their mandate certainly is uh, such that they should not meaningfully uh, have the existence of an election um, meaningfully influence their policy decisions. Now, that, you know, any organization is a political organization in one way, shape or form even as independent as the Fed is. And so it would make sense to me that they certainly wouldn't want uh, to look like they were engaged in a behavior that um, you know was supportive to one set of one, one candidate or another right ahead of uh, right ahead of an, elec an election occurring um, in order to sort of support their the clarity of them being independent. And so I think, the election itself is probably not that important 
uh, in terms of their policy. If they had a series of evidence, a substantial amount of evidence moving in one direction, for instance, if the unemployment rate went up 50 basis points or 100 basis points over the next you know, few months and the Fed hadn't done anything, they would then choose to cut. They would cut for sure, even right ahead of the election, because the evidence would be the the evidence of the data would be so overwhelming in one direction, right? That that, that they should ease. And so I think what it does do is it means that their threshold for taking action today, particularly as we get closer and closer to the election, the data threshold ha- it is higher. So you'd have to have a greater deterioration in employment or a greater elevation of inflation than maybe you normally would uh, because of those electoral considerations. I think as we go back to um, assets in this environment, probably challenging for stocks, challenging for bonds, but the opportunity right now in gold, I want to say the last time you and I spoke, it was like a 10% allocation to gold. Has that change for you or is that still the same what about like how how much gold exposure do you want in this environment you know i i think for any uh, you sort of want to separate um from a strategic or what i call our your savings portfolio your long-term savings portfolio which the point of a savings portfolio is it's very diversified across a wide range of different plausible outcomes and it should you know you should not have to pay attention to it Right, rebalance it once a year, not worry too much about it. I think that's a case where um, you know a ten percent gold allocation is quite compelling. Uh, taken out of a sixty forty portfolio, adds a lot of diversification benefit. Doesn't create so much tracking error against sixty forty, um, and so it's a good sort of high bang for the buck diversification move. I'd separate that point, and, and that you know because the the uh, idea of a savings portfolio is for any environment. Um, you know, whether we're in a certain environment or not shouldn't really influence your desired portfolio there for the, your long-term savings portfolio. I'd say then there's, you know, an alpha decision, which is, do you want to be tactically overweight or underweight gold here? As I said, I think if you're building your best set of bets in the market today, um, you know, a, a long gold position uh, and a long, a broad, a long, broad commodities position makes a lot of sense given how it's priced, which you know, it's gone up, but um, in the scheme of uh, all asset prices uh, that are out there, it's certainly still, you know, relatively depressed compared to, you know, say the stock market over the last 20 years or something like that. Um, and so, and relative to financial assets. And so, you know, I still think there's a real, uh, real good opportunity in gold uh, as an asset that's diversifying to your portfolio in this environment. And so if you're going to build that sort of tactical alpha portfolio, you know, that's really where I'd say shy away from stocks and bonds, hold more cash, lower risk, hold some gold, as well as uh, as well as uh, commodity position as well. And when you talk about like commodities in the universe of commodities, I mean, are you, are you thinking like energy, like oil? What are you kind of thinking about within the universe of commodities? Well, I think, you know, in, in general, um, you know, oil prices are probably the most the most direct way to have a pro, you know, a, a pro growth uh, bet on in the market, pro growth and pro inflation bet on in the market. And you can do that either through the stocks or through, you know, the oil producing companies, uh, if you're more of a stock investor or through, you know, holding the, the oil itself, uh, either directly or indirectly through, you know, futures or ETFs. Um, I think it's probably has the highest bang for the buck, though it is worth mentioning that uh, I think it's interesting when you look across the commodity complex, um, you have seen a broad-based rise uh, in a in a balanced portfolio of commodities. You know, I think we we come uh, that, that sort of cooled off in the last couple of weeks as bond yields have risen, but in general, you know, commodity prices uh, through the beginning, uh, you know, through April were basically at you know, close to 15 year highs in aggregate. And that reflects the fact that that pressure that exists in the market around, you know, growth and particularly nominal growth continuing to be very strong, much stronger than is appropriate uh, given inflation targets. And so I I think an opportunity, you either hold oil, it's sort of the simplest thing to do, or you can just hold a diversified basket of of commodities uh, like the CRB index or the equivalent 
which gives you a lot of diversification. You know, some commodities go up, some commodities go down at any point in time, but the whole basket together shifts the way that either growth or inflation expectations are shifting. Yeah. Okay. So gold and commodities, um, having some cash as well. Bob, um, I want to give you the final few moments here. Um, obviously, like let folks know um, where they can find you, maybe fill them in on some of the work that you do at Unlimited, but also like let's end with some parting thoughts. Maybe it's something that we didn't bring up in this conversation or it could even be something that you want to go back and reinforce. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, um, thanks so much for having me. If, if people want uh, to see more of the uh, my sort of ongoing flow of macro thoughts, you can definitely check me out at Bobby Unlimited on Twitter, uh, also uh, on YouTube as well with various clips uh, uh, in bite-sized uh, chunks in order to understand how I'm thinking about what's going on in the world. Um, and, uh, and definitely, you know, check out what we're doing on Unlimited uh, as well, um, which is bringing uh, diversified uh, hedge fund style strategies to, to every investor. Um, I think I'll probably leave with with the with the core idea that um, the the cycle that we're seeing today is very different than the cycle than that we've experienced the cycles we've experienced over the course of our professional careers, and so they require uh, the ability to sort of step back and really deeply understand uh, not the the fact that the dynamics that are driving them are unusual to us, but actually quite usual, quite common when you think about how. Uh, business cycles have and expansions have occurred, you know, across countries across time, which is that core idea of an income led expansion has a lot of second and third order consequences when it comes to monetary policy, asset prices, um, what's likely to transpire with, uh, with, you know, unemployment, inflation, et cetera. And so I think that's the main gap. And, and, and I see it all the time. I see it, for instance, if you read, you know, what the Fed writes, uh, Neil Kashkari came out with a with an essay that basically was like, I think monetary policy is tight, but growth doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, you know, somewhat confused, I think, by the cycle that we're seeing, and I think a lot of investors are confused by it. But if you if you reframe your thinking from credit driven expansions or a fiscal driven expansion to instead one that's a traditional income driven expansion, it's going to be very very helpful in framing and understanding what matters and what doesn't. Okay, let me ask you one thing before you go cuz that that I'm it see it confuses me too and I imagine it confuses a lot of folks as you point out. So why do you think it is confusing? Like where do you think if you had to kind of pinpoint where that comes from or what that is, what do you think it is? Well, I think the main thing that's confusing is um we've had cycles where inevitably excesses emerge and where monetary policy is effective at curbing excesses. So if you think about like the 06 to 08, you know, housing cycle, housing bubble driven cycle, right? We had huge credit growth, which got to a point where, um, where it was totally unsustainable, you know, like people were taking out greater than hundred percent LTV loans with no doc financing, you know, that didn't have jobs. Like that's the sort of thing it, you got to a point where there was so much debt creation that it was unsustainable that it was going to continue. And you had a circumstance where the Fed's tightening, the raising of interest rates at that time had, was relatively effective in slowing that cycle because 50% of the loans were uh, were uh, financed on the short end or were floating rate loans in one form or another. And so that's kind of our our, our framework. That's the way of our of our thinking. But what's happening today is that there is essentially no credit creation occurring uh, among households or businesses. It's, I mean, there's not literally zero, but we're basically at recession-like levels of credit creation already, and yet the economy expands. And and so that's, that's the thing that's confusing is that if you think about the economy through the lens of credit being the driver, and you think about the economy uh, through the lens of money being the driver, right? Because in the post-GFC period, you know, money creation went up and down and up and down, and that drove waves... Uh, in in the in asset prices in the macro economy, but again, what's happened in the post COVID period is, uh, in the last couple of years, is that uh, asset prices are going up, the economy is strong, and money creation is negative, right? 
And so what that highlights is it's not money creation. It's not credit creation. It's something different. It's a different type of financing of an economic expansion. And it's a, it, is, it is in many ways the oldest type uh, of financing of an economic expansion. If you just go back to periods where money supply was constant and where there weren't well-developed banks, how did you get business cycles? Well, someone started spending and they handed it to somebody and it was somebody's income and that person started spending and they handed it to somebody that was somebody's income. And that's a natural, that's not a spiral. I think too often people go, oh, well, you mean there's a spiral? It's not a spiral. It's just a, a self-reinforcing mechanism. It's not a spiral upwards or downwards. It's a, it's a reinforcing mechanism, a sustainable reinforcing mechanism that can continue for an extended period of time. And that's exactly what we're seeing is not credit, not money, um, even the fiscal story, which really mattered right after COVID. You know, we've had actually a fiscal contraction over the last three years. And nonetheless, we continue to see growth continue to plug along pretty well and we continue to see asset prices rise and it's all around that income point so i also take it no recession ahead or at least not anytime soon well i think the main thing on the on, on that idea is um in order to get you have to ask yourself what do you have to get in order to get a recession uh and if it's not credit growth slowing down and if it's not money growth slowing down then what you have to do is you have to you have to get that income growth that's happening you have to get people to spend less of that income. And how does that work? Well, the way that they spend less of that income is they get scared. They, you get scared that you have to save more and spend less. And so how does that happen? Well, the key way that that happens uh, is through asset prices fall. And so how are, so because, you know, as long as asset prices are going up and you're earning a good wage, like you keep spending, you know, it's very natural that people just keep spending as long, you know, if you're, again, if you're a middle-class household, like your house has gone up, 100% in value in the last, you know, five years. Your 401k is up, you know, 50 to 100% in value in the last five years. Like, there's no reason to save, right? So the question is, what creates the incentive to save? And what creates the incentive to save is falling asset prices. And what creates falling asset prices in this environment is rising bond yields. And so that's when you talk about when are we going to have a recession? We'll probably will have a recession. It'll happen at some point. The question is really the ordering, which is you start with uh, long-term interest rates have to rise, and then that'll hurt asset prices, and then that'll hurt spending, and then that'll hurt earnings and incomes, and then that'll hurt employment, and then that'll start to slow wages, and then that will create a slowing, uh, a sustainable slowing of demand. But the path is that is in that direction, right? So one has to it, the ordering matters first. Bond yields have to rise. <laughs> or, I mean, maybe there'll be an exogenous shock, but really, first, bond yields have to rise. That's the most, you know, that's the the most likely way in which this overall dynamic starts to slow. And we saw a taste of that last fall, but, you know, bond yields touched five and then they went down and there was a big easing that happened in response. And so we didn't really get that dynamic to play out long enough or high enough or painful enough to start to really shift what's going on with economic conditions. And so, the question is not really when will uh, when will a recession come. The question is much more what has to happen to get to the point of recession, and the first step of that is bond yields have to rise. Yeah, well, I have to say, Bob, fascinating conversation. I took so many notes. I learned a lot from you. You got me thinking in ways that I haven't been on this channel, and that's what I love about this show. It's just the diversity of viewpoints from my guests and giving you all the ability to articulate your ideas. Again, really fascinating conversation. Bob Elliott, co-founder, CEO, and CIO of Unlimited. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your ideas, all of your knowledge. Thanks again, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. It was great.